Our next lecturer is Emmanuel Gong. He is a, a faculty at University of Michigan. But I know quite a few of you are from kind of our nearby neighborhood, like Princeton, you know, our near neighbors. From those who are in kind of this tri-state area, it might be interesting for you to know that Emmanuel is on sabbatical leave at Flatiron Institute. So, you know, if you generate some interaction, you might be able to actually have, you know, in-person discussions with him. <coughs> uh, I think our first lecture went really well in terms of you guys all getting very engaged and asking a lot of questions. So I would just let you continue that. With that, let's welcome Emmanuel. All right. So, uh, welcome. Um, this lecture is about what everybody should know about programming or software engineering. And I realize it's not a physics lecture, and it's not supposed to be a physics lecture. So um, let me just outline the problem here. Um, right, we're, we're all scientists. We're all physicists, right? Our education and our tra training is in uh, physics. It's not in programming or software engineering. But uh, many of us write programs in their daily life. So who is writing programs day in, day out? Can I, can I see that? <laughs> All right, who is not writing programs day in, day out? Does LaTeX count? No. <laughs> I, I think I would count mathematics. Math, math. <laughs> math, math. <laughs> um, right, but uh, who here has a CS undergraduate degree? Wow. Who here has a formal computer science education even though it didn't lead to a degree? Right. So, so that is exactly, that's a problem set up that I want to address here, right? Um, <laughs> so few of us three have, have most of us have some basic programming, you know, some intro CS lecture, right? But few of the techniques there were actually software engineering techniques. It was just about getting stuff done, right? You were taught what, the, what a for loop walk was and then taught what a while loop was, but you never really were taught software engineering. Uh, at the same time, our algorithms get more and more complex, right? Back in the days, you could get a PhD with 200 line code. Um, those things are rarer and rarer. Who here is working with the density functional code? Yeah? Any, any idea how many lines? How big? Do you have any idea what it's doing? Others. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And a lot of the time that we spend is spent debugging. It's not spent, you know, thinking about physics or the problem. It's spent thinking about, you know, semicolons or easy ones, but then all of the stuff that comes with it. Um, who here spends more time debugging than writing code? All right. And if you're honest, right? <laughs> all right. Um, so at the same time, you know, for the advisors in here, code's life from student to student. It's life from year to year, right? But there's a problem at the transition. Who here has a code taken over from a previous student? Who here received the code and decided the code was so horrible, you have to throw it away and start from scratch? <laughs> yeah, you can see that. You can imagine how expensive this is, not just in uh, human time and in money, but also in like, intellectual capacity that went into designing those codes, right? So um, you can see that as time progresses, codes get messier and messier. And finally, there's nothing left, but you have to throw them out. You have to start from scratch, and you have to just get it done anew. So what I promise you in this one hour, 60 minutes that I have is uh, we'll take a little bit of investment in time, in tools, in techniques, and we'll use this to save you a lot of time programming, debugging, and maintaining code. Uh, the techniques that I'll uh, give you an overview of. They're mainly coming out of those two books, Clean Code by uh, Bob Martin, and Working Effectively with Legacy Code, right? And those are sort of standard books. If you uh, like what you see here, just go to the library, get those books, have a quick read. Uh, those are really useful techniques, and there's way more than I can uh, teach you here. So to give you a brief overview, I'll talk briefly about challenges. Then I'll uh, talk about how not to code, or how to avoid coding at all. Then I'll talk about how to code, namely tools and infrastructure. And finally, I'll try to talk a little bit about how to test, uh, not just test a little bit, but actually test properly in such a way that you can write your codes efficiently. And then uh, talk about PDD, and I'll tell you what PDD is uh, at that point. All right. So here are scientific codes, right? And you can see that we're sort of in a field of tension between various goals that we have here. Um, all of you 
you know, want to get higher, want to move on, want to get a PhD, we have a short-term mission that means get the papers out, right? As quickly as possible, no matter what the cost, right? Uh, at the same point, of course, the problem is very complex, right? If we knew what we were doing, we wouldn't be doing it, we'd be doing something else. Um, we have, you know, limited time to invest in knowledge uh, in, you know, reading computer programming books. It's just not part of the mission that we have here. There are long-term goals, like, you know, getting a project lined up for many years. Uh, and then there are also sort of, you know, scientific tool codes that are a little bit different, right? A lot of us are on supercomputers, on the computers, on the largest machines in the country. You know, those machines work a little bit differently from your PC. So uh, understanding this while also getting this done, that's really a tension that you uh, have to manage and that's not always um, easy. So um, remember your last big project, and it doesn't need to be your PhD project, it can be anything, right? Remember how you set out, right? You had a goal, right? You, you promised yourself you are not going to make that mess again. You started from a clean slate. You were going to do everything nice and proper, right? You had clean design, fast progress, right? And life was good. And then reality set in. And if you look at productivity as a function of time, right? As time progresses, right, you had a great idea. That great idea turned out to be not that great. Then your advisor came, and why you had this not so great idea. It's very complicated, but you have to humor your advisor. Um, you added a couple of bells and whistles that turned out to be not quite as useful, and you can see your productivity, you know, which was 100% previously, now goes and slows down because there's a lot of stuff that you have to track. Yeah. Is that instantaneous productivity or cumulative? <laughs> <laughs> I will leave that up to you. Right. Uh, you, you know, you had to add new features, right? You had to reproduce additional results. You had, you know, change requirements. All of a sudden, you decided to do something different, right? And that nice design that you had originally just wasn't quite as good anymore. And um, You'll see this all the time, right? This, this is what happens with sort of standard codes that you are uh, developing, right? What used to be quick and easy is not hard and slow. There's lots of code. There's lots of functionality that you have in there. Um, you're not quite sure what actually still works of that code. Um, you have a lot of dead code. Who here has dead code in their like, code that is not being used? Cyrus, yes? OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> everybody has that code somewhere, right? Um, you're not quite sure how you can progress without breaking anything. Actually, you're not sure if you haven't already broken something, you just haven't quite realized it, right? Um, well, how do you adapt to new environments and how do you clean what you have without restarting from scratch? So um, let's just ask two of the gurus here of the field. Uh, one is the inventor of C++ programming who says about programming that I like my code to be elegant and efficient. The logic should be straightforward to make it hard for bugs to hide. The dependency is minimal to ease maintenance, error handling complete according to an articulated strategy. And who of us has an articulated error handling strategy? <laughs> um, and performance close to optimal so as not to tempt people to make the code messy with unprincipled optimizations. Clean code does one thing well. So uh, Grady Bush over here says that clean code is simple and direct. Clean code reads like well-written prose. Clean code never obscures the designer's intent, but rather is full of crisp abstractions and straightforward lines of control. Now, this is beautiful. Who here has code like that? <laughs> right. So how do you get to code like that? And probably the first and most important thing that you need to remember is that in order to get to clean code, the first thing you do is you don't write code. <laughs> now, uh, the best way of not writing code is to use uh, libraries that allow you to avoid that. But before I go to libraries, let me briefly talk about languages, uh, programming languages. So this is a, a, a topic that um, you know, provokes a lot of uh, responses. Uh, to a large extent, it's a personal choice and it's a choice of the field. Quantum chemistry has always been using Fortran. If you're a chemist and you start using C++, you're going to be by yourself. Right? A lot of the physicists uh, you know, would use C++ rather than Fortran. Um, there's a lot of Python. 
Um, what I would like to tell you is that whatever you choose, try to choose a modern programming language which, which is in wide use in industry. Good chooses are C++, Python, and if your field says so, Fortran. For high performance code, C++, my personal opinion if, is if you use C++, well by now you can probably use C++ 11, but don't use anything fancier, C++ 14, C++ 17, or anything like that. Uh, try to boil your requirements down to a minimum, use well-established tools so that you can still run your code 20 years down the road, 40 years down the road. Um, whatever you use, it should be general, it should have compilers available everywhere, including on your washing machine. <laughs> if your compiler and you know GCC and your G4 kind will run on your washing machine, right? If your compiler runs on your washing machine, your codes will be able to compile 20 years down the road. And aim for that, right? Make sure that tools are available everywhere and stay away from any new language and exotic feature. Right? Julia, for example. Great idea, horrible in practice. Why? Because 10 years down the road, it's going to have to disappear. Right? Wait for somebody else to take the risk to start this, right? And you know, use the standard tools that really work everywhere. Uh, then that way, your code will still be okay 10 years down the road. If it doesn't compile on, and then insert your favorite platform here, you know, Fujitsu compilers or uh, BlueJean and so on, then probably it will limit your choices down the road. And if you use Fortran, you know, use the most modern Fortran language standards that you can come up with, and don't really use it unless it's required by your community. I know people have strong opinions of that. Anyway, <laughs> more importantly than what you use for programming, is how not to program. So libraries for physicists, right? Well, physics is based on math. Math, or many of the math building blocks, have been you know, thought about extensively by people who are smarter than you or me, right? There are entire numerical mathematics departments that think about how to compute stuff. And a lot of what comes out of there is then eventually encapsulated in libraries. It's tested, it's optimized, and it's foolproof. The disadvantage of using a library is, of course, well, you have an additional dependency that you need to maintain. You have to learn how to use it. And every now and then, your library may actually have bugs. That's a very, very rare occurrence. The advantages of using a library, you learn it once, and then you keep using it. You delegate the maintenance and the debugging and the documentation and all of these nasty tasks to people who are paid to do this and who actually know what they're doing. Chances are they're way better at this than you are. Right? And third, and not to be neglected, you keep your code short and clean. The fewer lines you have in your code, the fewer functionality you have in your code, the easier it is for somebody else, and somebody else might be you two years down the road, to go back to that code and understand what you were thinking. So strip out code, eliminate code, don't reinvent the wheel and don't optimize until you have to. So what follows are a bunch of low-level libraries and tools that are standard enough that you should never, ever try to code any of the functionality that you see there. Um, most standard one is the basic linear algebra system, or BLAS. Right? That one is historic. What it does is it's a de facto standard for low-level linear algebra routines. It's available on any machine, including your washing machine. Right? It's very often hand-optimized by the uh, hardware vendors, because they are interested in selling computers. Computers are sold by having high benchmarks. High benchmarks very often consist of running dense linear algebra. So the vendors will make a huge effort to optimize, say, matrix, matrix, multiplication routines, and similar things in such a way that uh, this is just provided on your platform. Then in order to use it, won't just read your platform's manual if you have a Mac, then you just have these frameworks that you can link if you have an Intel compiler, you link it with MKL, MKL here stands for math kernel library, there's the automatically tuned library, Atlas, there's the core math library, uh, there's ESSL and so on. So there's a huge, like every machine that you come up with will have the basic linear algebra system here uh, implemented. It's separated in three levels. It has matrix, matrix operations, it has matrix vector operations, and it has scalar vector and vector vector operations separated in these levels. Read the manual, don't ever 
pill three nested loops, which say AIJ is BIK times CK, uh, <laughs> right? Don't ever do anything like that. Whenever you can, abstract this out, put it into a library. LayPack, the linear algebra package, is the cousin of the basic linear algebra system. It essentially does all of the linear algebra solvers, right? And, you know, it links to mass, typically it has factorizations, it has eigensolvers, it has linear system solvers, all sorts of things. Uh, in case you work with linear algebra, right, don't open numerical recipes and start coding, right? Go in here, use the prepackaged software, you know, uh, chances are it's A, it has fewer bugs than what you have, uh, what you could code, and B, it's way faster than what you could code. It's just not worth your time and it's not your job to implement any of the functionality that is in here. Data storage. Um, one of the standard ways of storing data is you open a binary file, you dump your data in there and you close it. Problem with that is that you have to document your data storage file. Now, Asia 5 was developed at Illinois uh, essentially for NASA satellite data. This is a way of storing binary data in a hierarchical format with attributes and metadata information. That allows you to store your data in such a way that no matter what platform you're on, you can actually still open it and read it without jumping through hoops. Typical example, if you go to a supercomputer like a BlueGene and you write your binary data into a file, you then copy this over to your Mac, for example, and you open it there, your binary data will be garbled because the two machines have different conventions of how they store binary data, little, big ending versus little ending, right? HDF5 here abstracts all of that, takes care of it, still gives you all the advantages of binary data storage, right, without the disadvantages of, for example, language dependence or, or you know, platform dependence and, and so on. Um, if you're using C++ and you're using matrices, well, there's a library called Eigen that has all of the matrix functionality that you might ever use. So don't ever write matrix classes. If you're using a different type of programming uh, environment from Python to Fortran to Mathematica, right? those have their own ways of handling numerical data. Use those. Don't come up with your own. And Boost is also C++. That's a general purpose library. And then in addition to that, there are all sorts of platform, or sorry, of application domain specific libraries, like for example, Alps if you're working in, uh, you know, in computational uh, physics or you know various chemistry packages that you can use and that you should use rather than writing uh, your own packages. All right, so now that I've told you how to not write code, let's go over the case where you actually need to write code. And let me just poll everybody here. Who is using an integrated development environment for writing code? Okay. Who, who is using an editor like VI or Emacs? OK. Uh, who is using anything else? All right. Um, who is using a documentation tool? Doxygen or Cousin? Doxygen? Who is using a revision control system? OK. I hope that by the end of my talk here, this will be 100%. Um, <laughs> Those of you who are using a revision control system, uh, get subversion, CBS, still anybody? A Mercurial, I think, has disappeared. Who here is using a unit test system? Very good, one person. A uh, build script, or CMake, or just make files, handwritten. Who here is using a debugger? Almost nobody. Who's here, here is just printing instead of debugging. OK. Is anybody <laughs> using a parallel debugger? Good. I never, I never got to, I never understood how to use these. Anybody here using a memory debugger, like Valgrind and Cousins? A little bit? OK. Anybody not familiar with any of the terms that I've mentioned here? <laughs> OK, good. So um, there's no way I can go through all of this. But pick this as, as keywords that these are interesting things to look up if you have half an hour somewhere on a, on a train or so. 
Uh, there's a lot of stuff behind this. These are very useful tools. Uh, if you don't use them, make a deliberate decision not to use them because you don't like them. Don't just don't use them because you don't know about them. Right? Know that IT professionals have developed countless tools over the last you know, four decades or so that make developing codes easier. There's a reason why professionals don't use BI anymore. Right? Let me try to show you that reason. And, and <laughs> you know, let me try to help you accelerate your uh, development process a little bit. So all I'm going to do here is give you a, a couple of pointers, and then you're going to have to look uh, for these things yourself. First, IDEs. Seriously, BI. <coughs> um, there are a couple of integrated development environments. Uh, Eclipse is one. On OS X, you have Xcode. There's KDevelop. There's a similar one under GNOME. Uh, there's Visual Studio on, on the Windows. Those are development environments that uh, do I have a picture here, right? That looks something like this. What you have here in the middle is some random code, and it really doesn't matter what it is. What I want you to look at is that there's stuff here on the left, there's stuff here on the right. There's actually quite a lot of stuff here on the right. right? This is additional information. It's additional information that your IDE gives you trying to understand your course code, parse your code, and help you, you know, with uh, you know, completing, refactoring, and so on uh, your code. Class hierarchy, function completion, right? Compilation and syntax checks as you type. All of this is very, very valuable. All of this, you know, saves you half a second here and there. But the half a second over the course of a day add up. It is integrated, meaning you're compiling, debugging, and running within seconds. And you'll see that the, a fast cycle of compiling and running and compiling and running and compiling and running and so on is very valuable when you're writing with unit tests, with tests during development. It integrates seamlessly with the versioning system, right? That again helps you cut down your, your workflow. And uh, one of the things to know about the IDE, it takes you about a day for, to just set up the IDE. It takes you about a week to get comfortable in the IDE. It probably takes you about a month to get faster than with VI. But then you're never going to look back, right? This is something that has a, a learning curve that is a little bit nasty, but it's totally worth investing the uh, time into uh, getting to know uh, an integrated development environment. Versioning control. So who here is not using versioning control? All right. If there's one thing I tell you here, you should use versioning control. No excuses. Right? What this is is a program that keeps track of the changes of your, of your program that you made. Um, it allows you to go back in time to see when a function you know, or a functionality still works. And it keeps just track and helps you to develop uh, with this. Git these days is the standard uh, platform for doing this. Um, for public open source codes, get a GitHub repository. For closed scientific codes, get a GitHub repository. Apply for an educational GitHub repo. It's for free, right? And uh, that will allow you to have your code safely backed up on the cloud, uh, in addition to the local copies that you have uh, locally. Please do not stand up your own servers. Right? You don't want to have your code base that you worked on for two years somewhere on a crappy server somewhere in a basement. You forgot to back it up, and then you know a fire starts, and, and you lose all of this. Yes. Are, are you concerned about the purchase of Git by Microsoft? Um, no, because the moment Git misbehaves, uh, that code will just simply maybe migrate it to Bitbucket or some other. Uh, company. You know, the nice thing about Git is that every copy of the repository or every check out of the repository has the full copy of the repository. So the moment Microsoft blows up GitHub, that thing will just be pushed to somewhere else and, and I could not care less. Um, uh, right, so, so please don't stand up your own servers. Uh, if you're using one of those old programs converted to Git, there's really no reason to keep using them. And uh, do you know how to branch, merge, rebase, or resolve conflicts? I have here a practice session that we did in a different summer school where these lectures come from. Um, that's something very useful that you should just, you know, if you have 15 minutes, you should do a tutorial on YouTube. You know, there are about 200 of them. I checked this morning. And, uh, you know, pick your random one. They're all the same. And just follow along to learn how to operate a repository uh, like that. 
If you prefer graphical user interfaces, use source stream, use the GitHub uh, user interface, uh, and, and learn about the additional functionality that you could uh, get there. Why Git? So first of all, it's decentralized, meaning, you know, as, as I just said, if, if Microsoft nukes GitHub, right, uh, this is independent of the central repository. You can just push it somewhere else. You can have multiple copies of that. It's very easy to branch. It's very easy to merge. And that allows you a workflow flow where as you're going through your code and you're doing changes, if you decide to do a change, well, you start a branch, you do your change, you merge your branch. You start a new branch, you do your change, you merge your branch. That then allows you to, to uh, separate different bugs that you might have introduced and to really separate different issues that you have in your code and thereby isolate uh, problems faster. Excuse me, what, when you say merge, I'm not sure I understand. Oh, yeah, so the, the way these revision systems work oops, is they have a copy of your code, right? You then make a so-called branch, so a local copy of your code, you work on that branch, right? And then once you're done working, you, you bring the changes that you've done back into the sort of central uh, copy, right? So, so what you should do, or the workflow that we say, previously we used to say with subversion or so, you know, you, you do something, you make a major change, and once you're done and everything works, finally you commit this back, right? Here the workflow with Git is, is a little bit faster. It should be more branches, more merges, right? It should be very frequent that you bring back your code. However, never bring back code that doesn't work. Because imagine something doesn't work, and you have to backtrack. You have to bisect to find a feat, you know, the point where you broke a feature. You want to be able to go somewhere random in the middle and have a guarantee that your code works at that time. Because if it doesn't, you're going to have to go, you know, one by one by one back or one by one by one forward until it compiles again. So make sure that whenever you commit, everything uh, works. All the tests should always pass. Um, all right. Testing frameworks. Who here uses a testing framework? Okay, one, two people. So this is really one of the major innovations in software engineering over the last like 15 years or so. And I'll talk a lot more about this when we talk about unit tests. And the basic idea is that you don't just have your code. Next to your code, you have a separate code that's only, whose only purpose it is to test your code. That the code that tests your original code, that's the so-called uh, unit test framework. And here you have one of those, there are many of those. Uh, JUnit for Java, for example, was the first one uh, that helps you test here in, for example, test a small feature of a 2D Ising model simulation, where, for example, you just create a simulation, then you test that you can get the length and the temperature, then you test that you can uh, get the right flip probabilities, and so on. You have all of these individual tests that will be combined separately. You can then run them, right? And you can see, oh, this test passed, this test passed on, oh, and then here there's a test failure that tells you that something in your code is not OK. I'll have a little bit more to say about this in, in just a bit. Now, um, how do you know that your code works? Well, ideally, you'll have tests. You can run your tests, right? And uh, uh, well, if you have two or more people with commit rights, how do you know that you know one person didn't write somebody else's work? Right? That that's going to lead to fights fast if you know some person keeps breaking somebody else's work, right? If you're writing a library, how do you know that the code that you're working on actually works for all of your users? You might be using the Intel compiler. All of your users use GCC or something like that. Some of the things that Intel, some of the quirks that the Intel compiler allows might just simply not work on uh, GCC. How do you know that it works on the Blue Gene? How do you know that it works on the Fujitsu compiler or you know, on your washing machine? Right? If you're using a library that frequently changes, how do you know that your code is compatible with the newest and best version of that library, that all of the features actually work? Right? How do you know that updates don't break your code? And this is where continuous build and continuous delivery come in. That's a technique where you make a change, you test it locally, right? You touch your code, you update a dependency, something like that. You make sure that it works on your computer. You check it in, you commit it to that repository. You push it off to the cloud, to GitHub or whatever. And then once it arrives there, it runs automatically a test suite 
right? All of my tests on a large range of platforms, all of the exotic compilers that don't work or sort of partially work. And it verifies that what, uh, that this thing then behaves as expected. In other words, it goes back to your unit test framework, it runs all of these tests automatically, and it checks that every single one of those tests pass. If a test fails, you immediately get an email. You get this email typically within about five minutes of doing something bad, right? You've just tested it locally, so you still know what you were doing. You still know what you, how you broke it. You can go right back, fix it, or undo your change and investigate uh, further. Uh, so that helps you to make your codes robust uh, against uh, changes uh, out there. Now, of course, in order to test your code, right, you need to have tests. Something has to tell your code whether it works or whether uh, it doesn't work. And there are really two types of tests that we have uh, for our codes. The first type of tests are so-called integration tests, or are your acceptance tests. And those are tests that guarantee that a code, you know, as a physicist would say, works. Right? It, you have some non-trivial result, maybe you have some analytic result or something like that, and the acceptance test will reproduce that result and then check that it's actually correct. The second type of test is a type of test that I've mentioned a couple of times in here, uh, so-called unit tests. And those are small tests that take, test a very small part of the functionality of your code. For example, they check a function, they check that a class works as intended, and so on. And having unit tests in your code that has been one of the big sort of paradigm shifts in software engineering over the last, well, more like 15 years, not 10 years, um, for scientists, right, we're actually fairly good at testing the big, the large scale things. Right, we have a scientific code, we're not quite sure if it works or not, we go, we take a piece of paper, we do the analytics, we get a curve out of it, then we run our code to you know, reproduce that curve and make sure that everything you know, agrees within error bars or within any digits or whatever it is, right? And uh, then you know, look at the result. That, those tests are very powerful, but they're also very expensive because they require you to you know, take the paper, do the analytics, you know, print the curve, put in on top of the other curves, make sure that they're actually okay, right? So these are tests that take you an after and afternoon until you have confidence in your code again. Unit tests are much smaller than that. Right? Unit tests really just make sure that the function works the way it's on the test. Make sure that you know, something small, five lines of code actually do what they're supposed to do. And typically, uh, this is formalized here in, in uh, well, having like three pieces of code rather than two pieces of code. Typically, you have an interface that declares the functionality of say a class or so, you have an implementation where you get the actual work done, and this is what all of you have currently. You then, in addition, have a testing class or a testing framework that has the tests, and the only task of this here, of this testing framework, is to make sure that the implementation here behaves the way that it's intended to behave. So, imagine, what if you had a code where every single line of your code was tested? What if it was very easy to rerun these tests? And you could rerun all of your tests within a couple seconds and get guaranteed that all of these tests work. Well, if you can test, if you can trust your tests and trust that your tests check that your program is correct, you can always run them, make sure that you have complete confidence in your code. Whenever you introduce a bug, that breaks old code, you know, while you're trying to implement something new or extend your code, you can automatically detect it. And, you know, as you're detecting it, right, when you're breaking it, you can go back and say, oh yeah, that was supposed to work like this, and you can immediately fix it. And this is how unit tests help you cut down on the debug time, right? By detecting problems right away and early, they cut down the debug time, they give you a small cost of increased development time, and they give you quite a bit more code that you have to maintain, because now in addition to having your interface and your implementation, you're also going to have to take care of a test. The payoff is, or the sweet spot, is whenever you spend a long time debugging and understanding code, and comparatively little time you know, actually writing this code. 
And when I started this, I asked, you know, who here spends a lot of time debugging? And I saw a lot of uh, hands up here, right? So if you are in the crowd that spends a lot of time debugging on not being sure if the code works or having dead code in your code, right? This is the type of technology that can actually uh, help you quite a bit. So let me uh, try to um, give you a little bit of an overview over the next couple of minutes of how this technique works and what you can do with it and how you can benefit from it. All right, so again, imagine what if all the important lines of your code were tested? What if it was very easy to rerun this test? Well, let's say you want to do something new. Right now, the philosophy is never touch a running system. Right? You don't want to screw up the hard work that you did. You don't want to break somebody else's code. So what you do is you do the minimum hack to make things work. And that is what brings a lot of the messes into your code, right? When I was talking about how your codes decay over time, you know, you had your own not so great idea and your advisor's horrible idea, right? Probably as time goes on, you leave those things in there, you're trying to change little things, make sure that it doesn't break what you had before, but you're really not quite sure who here knows what I'm talking about. Yeah, right, you're really not quite sure if you can still get that code to work. Now, if it would very easy, if you could very easily verify that your code works, imagine how fearless you would be in just changing your code. You're gonna detect all of the problems with that code right away, right? If you break something, you just fix it. And that now allows you to refactor. It allows you to go in there and change your code so that the structure is better, it's easier to read, it's easier to maintain, right? And it stops the decay of your code. Combined with the versioning system, right, your Git or whatever, right, you shouldn't be able, uh, you shouldn't be afraid of deleting code because you have a full track rate history of what you have been doing before. If you need that old code back, just go look it up, right? Bring it back in, bring the unit code, uh, unit tests back in, look at it, right, reintegrate it into your code. Um, so from the never touch a running system, we've changed to the Boy Scouts rule. Leave your campground cleaner than you found it. The rule is not never touch a running system. The rule is take your code, refactor it. Whenever you go over your code, look at it, change it, make it be simpler, make it be easier to understand, right? And because you have unit tests that give you control over this, right, you can actually do that with full confidence that you're not breaking anything. All right, unit tests are tests that test very small features. I told you, you know, five lines of code, a small function. A class interface, something like this. Now, having small features tested means that you are forced to take your code and break it up into small chunks. If it's not broken up into small chunks, you can't test small features, right? So, the breaking up into small codes, technical word is decoupling, right? Uh, having, being able to test small features means being able to decouple your code. That means unit tests force you to write modular codes which have clear dependencies and clear boundaries, right? You're gonna have clear interfaces where a different part of the code calls this part of the code or is dependent on this part of the code. Modular code is way easier to maintain, right? The main reason for that is that if you need to understand the modular code, well, you need to understand it one module at a time. You don't have large dependencies that end to start out in one part of your code and go all the way over to some different part of your code. Now, the tests, uh, once you're done, are then removed from the main code. They just live in the unit framework. So the code that you're shipping, or the code even that your advisor gets to see, right, they never need to have the unit test framework uh, attached to it. Right? And the production code will never know that these tests even exist. But if you have somebody else working on that code, or if it's you yourself who comes back to that code two years down the road, the unit tests are your best possible documentation that you can have for your code. Because now it documents every single function of your code. It tells you exactly how you intended to call that function, what the variables were, right? what the names were, you know, what the different boundary conditions were, what the test cases were. Right? All of these is out there just in your code, and it shows every single way that a class or a function is supposed to be used. Of course, unit tests will not cure all of your bugs. right? The logic problem, the sort of thinking problems that you did, they're still there, right? 
it's the small computing problems that sort of logic bugs that, that get eliminated, or, or not logic bugs, but you know, the, the smaller programming bugs that get eliminated by these uh, things. They can introduce their own problems, right? They can be too slow to execute. If you have, uh, you know, a thousand tests and tests run in 10 milliseconds, it will test you, uh, take you 10 seconds to test your entire code. Typically, you would like to have your code tested in about a second or so. Um, if you can test your code in about a second, then you can run these unit tests very, very often. Essentially, you uh, implement the test, you implement five lines of code, you run the entire test suite that takes you a second, right? and then you go back to, to implementing this. So too much overhead and too much baggage is one of the limitations that you can uh, run into. Does that mean you don't need to catalog the dependencies because you're just testing everything? Um, I, I think these are separate issues. So, so well-written unit tests will just test the module at a time, right? Now there are intermodular dependencies, and there are tests that still have to test that all of these, you know, modules properly talk to each other. Um, those tests are then more acceptance tests, right? They test big scale functionality rather than sort of testing a, a functionality of a small module. But then there's a smooth boundary between those. I was confused because you said a, a thousand tests, 10 milliseconds a piece. So those thousand tests would just be one module? They're typically the entire program. Right? Um, and then a thousand tests is not crazy. So as, as you're writing your, your code, right, you know, that means 5,000 lines if you have a unit test testing five lines of code. Uh, you know, a couple of boundary conditions, a couple of special cases, right? I mean, uh, it adds up quickly. That's why it's important that these, uh, uh, that these, co uh, these tests execute very quickly. All right, so in practice, let's get a little bit less uh, um, philosophical and a little bit more practical about this. How do you actually do this? How do you debug, right? Assume, you know, you find a bug in your code, and I would say, assume you find unexpected behavior in your code, you suspect a bug, you don't even know if there's a bug or not, you suspect that something is fishy, right? What do you do? Well, first, you write a test. You write a test that fails, that checks functionality that should be one way, but clearly your code shows that it's another way. You then start debugging. Right? Debugging means you go into that code, you keep writing more of these tests. Some of these tests will pass, some of these tests will fail. I just asked you before, you know, who is using a debugger and who is using just C out? Or get, you know, the standard print? Well, if you're using the standard printing routines, you are essentially just doing this, right? You were testing, you know, some lines in your code and making sure that these lines were supposed to be doing what they were supposed to do, right? Don't do it that way. Write the unit test instead. Right? Put them outside of your functions. Validate your assumptions out there. Right? You'll see some of these tests will pass, some of these tests will fail. The fail tests mean that either you didn't understand what the code was supposed to do, or they show you where the bug is. Finally, you find the bug, you fix the bug, all of the tests pass. Now remember, in your old way of doing this with printing the debug statements or having your debugger, what you would do is either quit the debugger or delete all of those nasty print statements. At that time, all of that information that you had for validating and testing a function is gone. And you're like in, you know, an acrobat without the net. You're just hoping that you're not going to fall again, right? But in a unit test framework, you have these unit tests. What you can do there is leave the tests where they are, clean them up a little bit, make sure that they actually test sensible stuff, right? Clean them in there, and then you have a guarantee that if that bug ever comes back, you're immediately going to find it because you have tests then that would fail in case you're having this problem again. And that means that the bugs are guaranteed not to come back the next time you encounter something similar. You already have a bunch of tests that are right there, right? You need to extend them to see what else is going on, right? You find the new bug, right? But it'll be easier because you already have a bunch of tests. And then you keep operating like this, and uh, you keep cleaning and cleaning until all the tests pass. In science, uh, very often the best tests that we have are just inverse problems. Uh, so 
we often have a difficult formal problem and very easy inverse problem. For example, if you have a number, you factorize it, right? The solution is difficult, but going back is super easy. You can probably find similar types of you know, tests that you can do in your science application. Those are ideal uh, test cases for quick acceptance tests. Right? They usually test, test, test the limit of your code, they test, test some analytics, they test something that you understand very well, you know, non-interacting, isolated system, high temperature limit, something like that. That's those, you know, use that knowledge, build it in into your code, test something non-trivial that usually goes very, very uh, quickly. Uh, yeah, these were the special cases, so let me uh, skip that and go to uh, a technique that now really allows you to uh, write tests in a, in a you know, slightly better way. So, I told you that right, having tests is beautiful. You always know that your test works as intended. But if you go back to my second slide that I put up where we had this field of tension between the different goals that you have in your science career, Right? First and foremost, you have to get papers out. You have to get science results published. So, in practice, we don't actually, we don't ever put the unit tests, right? We don't actually go to the work of implementing this because, you know, when we write these tests, first of all, all of these tests clutter up the code. Well, that one is solved by the unit test framework. You just separate it out in a separate framework. But, you know, there really is no need because once we've tested our routine by hand, we know that it works. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, and writing tests takes time, time that we could otherwise use, uh, write to, uh, otherwise use to uh, write new code, add new features, right? Go on with the science project. So, in practice, if you think of writing a beautiful code first and then adding a couple of unit tests after the fact, that's just something that never really works in practice. It just that people are not designed to be good at this. Um, so question is, how do we cover our code completely with tests? How do we get tests you know, into our code in such a way that they're actually you know, there and not just when shit hits the fan, but you know, at the time of writing the code when we still know what's actually going on? And this is TDD, uh, or test driven development. And you should think of test driven development a, a little bit like uh, how should I put this? It's it's a it's a discipline. It's like you know martial arts or playing the violin, right? It is something that takes a lot of training, and it takes a lot of training at the beginning. That is, you know, it's not just like strumming your guitar a little bit. You actually have to learn how to do it right, and doing it right at the beginning will slow you down. The same way that the IDE will slow you down, but right. When you do it and when you learn how to do it, it will accelerate you vastly uh, as you go. So, TDD says you are not allowed to write any production code or any one of the functionality in your code unless there is a failing test. Not compiling is failing. As soon as you have a failing test, you have to write code to make that test pass. You are not allowed to write more code than is needed to make your test pass. Okay? So this is a dogma. This is religion out here. Um, it sounds hopelessly useless and rigid. <laughs> it is actually very, very powerful, and you should just give it a try. Right? It works very well in practice. It will slow you down a little in the short run, and it will accelerate you a lot as you go on in uh, your career. In practice, and I'm afraid, so I have hats for this, but I forgot my hats at home. Uh, you have three hats that you need to wear. Red, green, and blue, or red, green, refactor. These are the three phases of TDD. You always, when you're sitting in front of your terminal, you have to imagine yourself having either a red hat, a green hat, or a blue hat. The red hat is what you have if your code currently works which means you're not allowed to touch, to, to touch your code. You have to work on a test, right? Why do you have your red hat on? Your code stays the way it is, and you're only allowed to write in the test files. Once you have a test that fails, 
you put your test hat down, you put your production code hat on, at this point, you're only allowed to write as much code as it takes to make that failing test pass, right? That's the green phase. Once you are done with the green phase, you go to your test and your production code, and you're cleaning up. The technical, code, uh, technical word for clean up is refactoring, right? You go, you're not allowed to add or remove any sort of functionality. You're just cleaning up, you're making your code nice and readable, you know, simpler, combining things and so on. And then, right, green refactor, red, green refactor, red, green refactor. That's the way you're coding, function after function, you know, first the test, then the implementation, then you go, you clean up one, you clean up the other. First the test, then the function, and so on. And by the end of the day, or by, by the end of an afternoon, you have a nicely, fully documented, fully tested uh, implementation. <coughs> All right, so. Let's go over this red face, right? You have your red hat on, you have a working code, a clean code, and all of the tests pass. Think about the feature you would like to add in the next step. Find a small step towards that feature, for example, in this function. Write a test for that function. Well, this is a simple icing system over here. For example, you have a spin configuration here. You flip a spin somewhere. You compute the total energy, you know what the energy should be, right? Uh, if you write this here, expect equal uh, is a testing function that makes sure that this here should be equal to that here, right? You run that test, it fails, because for example, you haven't implemented total energy. Now, your red face is there, right? Your compiler gives you a red warning, your code fails, doesn't even compile, right? What do you need to do to implement that feature? Well, you need to implement enough to make your test pass, right? There you go, you have to implement this total energy function, right? As soon as that test passes, fingers off your keyboard, right? You have a test that works, you have an implementation that works. Go over both of these, clean up, right? Make your code read readable, right? Don't be afraid that you're gonna destroy anything you can. It's automatically tested, right? Um, just uh, go over your production code, you know, extract duplicate code into function, remove your unused code, go over function and variable names, make them readable, make sure they're descriptive and clear. That's why your IDE comes in, right? Click on your variable names, rename, right? Click on your duplicate code, go to extract function. All of these things are fancy built-in functions in your IDE that now, help you, you know, save minutes every time you do that. And because the minutes when you're doing this add up, right, it will be hours by the end of the day. So this is where IDEs become very, very powerful in this refactoring step, where you have tests and your code and you clean up both of these. Repeat the cleanup with your unit tests. That's very, very important. Go over this, add a comment if it's something is unclear. Make sure that, that everything's clean. Right? Cleaning your tests is as important as cleaning up your code. If you have a test that doesn't test anything anymore, remove it. If you have tests that naturally should be combined, combine them. Right? Go over this, clean it up. Right? And during the refactoring, you're just doing identity operations. You're not adding or removing any functionality. Your code always remains correct. All of your tests will tell you so. Right? And by the end of that refactoring step, you go back into the red track phase. Red, green, refactor, red, green, refactor, all day long, right? So, having to test your code early means that it always works. The time between having something that doesn't compile and something that compiles is probably about five seconds or so, right? That means that, you know, whenever you go get up and leave for a coffee, or so you, you have a working code there. It may not do everything that you want it to do, but it's always working. Having to write small independent tests means that your code does not develop long range dependencies, right? Everything stays small, everything is encapsulated. The modules are small and therefore they're easy to understand for somebody else looking at your code or for you yourself looking at the code two years down the road. The debugging is way simpler because any of those bugs that you introduce you introduce them in those five lines you just touched. 
right? That makes it really simple to go back, refactor it, rethink it, go over your logic, understand it again, uh, and then uh, make a failing test uh, pass. Now, again, all of this is, of course, completely useless for you because you have been handed down a code from you know, a previous graduate student or a postdoc, and of course that code didn't have any tests. And the typical scenario is you start working on a project, there's a code, and the code is a mess. Again, can I see those hands? Yeah, we had have, we have way more at the beginning. Um, so how do you proceed? How do you make changes to that code, right? Typically, your advisor gives you that code, you have some project that you need to implement, you have to add an additional functionality. So as you're now working to, through that existing code, right, traditionally you would add print statements and then go over those print statements and then you know, understand this and remove the print statements again. You just add the unit tests. Add the test. Once you have the, this test covered, uh, or the, the code covered with these tests, go in there, force that rule, right? Clean up. Now you can because you have the tests. Fix bugs if there are bugs. Add functionality if there is new functionality. How you make sure that you don't break anything, right? How should, should you rewrite or should you change the existing code base? Or, well, uh, well, how do you do it? You just download your unit test framework, uh, link to it, compile to it, change your IDE to add to it, analyze enough of the code to understand where your changes should more or less go, test that part for all the imaginable scenarios, cover that code with your tests, make all of these tests pass on the existing working code, right? Make sure that tests actually do something sensible, they test uh, what you want them to test, and once you have confidence in your tests, start working with that, right? So go back to Grady Wood, she said that clean code reads like great well-written prose, refactor until it does. Combine your function, right? Merge functionality. You can do that. You have tests, right? Bring the code into a state where you can actually start to work with it. And then, once you're there, well, how do you do that? Here I have rename variables, decouple your code, extract your functions, extract your classes, and make sure that your code is modular and, and uh, decoupled, right? Once you're there, right, you can finally add new functionality. And now you do new functionality with TDD. You write a test, test fails. You go back to the production code, you implement just enough to make that test fail. Then you go over both of these, and you clean up and you make it understand. You go back, you write another test, right? Uh, at all of the time, all of your tests should pass, all of your code should remain correct, and that really means that you need confidence in what your tests are doing. All right, we don't have time for this, but uh, if this looks like something that you might want to do, or a technique that might be useful for you, take something that you're confident with. Write a two-dimensionalizing simulation, or, you know, I don't know, a Harky Fox code, or a simple one, or something like this. Um, write it using test-driven development. Just you know, write a test, write the code, refactor, right, green, refactor, right, green, refactor. See whether you can actually do it. Be strict with it, and then once you see how it works in principle, adapt it to something that you can work with in practice and that will speed you up in practice. While you're doing this, try to set up an IDE, you know, try to see where you can actually get the IDE to be helpful with this. Now, typically, in an IDE, you just click F5 and all of your test results go come to up right under it. it. Takes you about a second to just see that everything is still working, and then you go back to the factor right here. All right. Uh, with that, I think I'm uh, out of time. Um, I hope this was useful. If not, please let me know. Questions? Paul. Do we have to worry about the temperature warning? <laughs> <laughs> Put on a jacket. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, that, light in the projector uh, lens, like all. Yeah, that's just from the projector. Yeah. Yeah. So the question I have. Um, that wasn't your question. Yeah, no, well, <laughs> <laughs> but um, your real question. Uh, 
So I'm curious, a, a lot of you know, the IDE and the framework you have uh, is applicable to the sort of C++ programming that you do. I, I'm thinking for you know, a lot of the graduate students here and, and me, a, a lot of it I do in an IPython notebook. Right. That's neither Emacs nor is in an IDE, strictly speaking. And I'm just wondering, is there a framework that, you know, if I, I could imagine doing your exercise with the uh, icing model, but it would still be, you know, these command line programs and running and it wouldn't have this sort of integrated functionality. Does an environment work like that for Python? Yes. So th there's environment for every programming languages, uh, language that I know. There's one for Python, there's one for Java, there's one for C++, there's one for Fortran. The, the techniques here are so standard that people have developed this. It all comes, they all have the same syntax, it all comes out of JUnit, the, the Java unit test program. Um, I, I, I can show you what it looks I like. I know there's that. PyCharm. Does that implement this? Or do you know I, what framework implements it? I think it's called it? PyUnit. PyUnit? Yeah. Any other question? So who's convinced to try unit test? Or well, to start with IDE or the versioning, any one of them, who's convinced to try it? 